You have, may have heard of the governor who was running for a second term in office. One day after a busy morning chasing votes and note lunch, he went to a church barbecue. And it was late in the afternoon. The governor was famished. As he moved down the serving line, the lady with the chicken put one on his plate and turned to serve the next person in line. Excuse me, said the governor. Do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? Sorry, the lady told him. I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to every person. But I'm starved, said the governor. Sorry, the lady said again. Only one to a customer. The governor was a modest and unassuming man. But he decided the time had come to throw his weight around. Do you know who I am, he said. I'm the governor of this state. Do you know who I am, the woman said. I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move along, mister. <laughs> we all know people who like to throw their weight around through words or actions. I call those people Mrs. Gensmer. The real Mrs. Gensmer was an intimidating head nurse at Children's Heart Hospital in Philadelphia. She didn't like children, apparently. Her strict and criticizing nature made all of us shrink in her presence. Once my friend came to visit and gave me a small gift. After visiting hours, the girl across the aisle in the ward said, I want to see it. And so I threw it across the aisle, but I was two feet short. She slipped out of bed and picked it up, and just then Mrs. Gensmer came in. She gave us all a dirty look. She swept up the object, told the girl to get back in bed, gave me a dirty look, and swished out of the room. And I never saw that gift again. To this day, I can't even remember what it was because I had it in my hand such, such a short time. Years later, I met another Mrs. Gensmer. This was an intimidating boss. You didn't want to be caught doing anything that she thought was irresponsible or her piercing eyes and words would cut you down. When she walked into our department, we held our breath wondering what was going to happen this time. So, it amazed me that when Carrie and I got married, she was offended because she didn't get an invitation. Is it possible that the Mrs. Gensmers of this society don't know how they appear to other people? Jesus operated on a different kind of authority. Because the, the synagogue was a place of learning, visiting speakers were not unusual. So Jesus stood up read some scripture, rolled up the scroll, and sat down. He spoke with such authority, his listeners were amazed. None of the scribes spoke like that. The Greek word authority actually means out of oneself, and Jesus' wisdom came from within. His teaching had absolute power, not unlike, unlike this, the synagogue scribes. This, this is from one author. He says, rabbinical teaching had no uh, in, sorry, inherent authority. Most rabbis taught only the, the Torah, the common Torah that the community knew. The rabbis quoted the rabbis, quoted the rabbis who quoted the rabbis, and that's the only authority they ever had. There was a small class of rabbis that generally traveled and had disciples and were in high standing with the people. And Jesus was this kind of rabbinical teacher. It happened that while Jesus was preaching, a man with an unclean spirit entered the synagogue. He was demon possessed. And being in the synagogue was an offense all on its own. Besides, he was loud and disruptive. The people of Jesus' day took demon possession very seriously, and Jesus did too. Identifying Jesus and his authority, the unclean spirit said, What do you want with us? I know you. You're the Holy One of Israel. Are you here to destroy us? Jesus simply said, Be silent and come out of him. The spirit shrieked, threw the man down, and left. 
And the worshipers were amazed at this demonstration of power. Jesus had the power to make the unclean clean. This must be some kind of new powerful teaching, they said. He has power to order evil spirits out of people. Jesus showed his authority in both word and in deed. In this earliest of the canonical gospels, Mark shows the power of God on the loose. The question, who is Jesus, punctuated his gospel. And this question deserves more than a Sunday school answer. The question, the, the unclean spirit recognized Jesus. The listeners were amazed, but did they recognize themselves who Jesus was? Because something happens in that spiritual, when that spiritual transition takes place. When Peter walked on the water and Jesus saved him from drowning, Peter said, you are the son of God. When Paul encountered God on the road to Damascus, God changed Paul's life direction. And after years of spiritual torment, Martin Luther finally grasped that we are saved by God's grace and not by works alone. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, living his last days in prison because he opposed Hitler, wrote, that who is Jesus is the most important question we must answer. What is it about Jesus' authority that turns the world upside down? Like the man with the unclean spirit, many things can hold us hostage. Chains of ideology, mental, emotional, or spiritual chains. Kathleen Norris writes, when I think of the demons I need to exercise, I have to look inward to my heart and soul. Anger is my best demon. Useful when I go into a woman warrior mood. Harmful when I use it to gratify myself, either in self-justification or to deny my fears. My husband, who has a much sweeter nature than I do, she said, once told me that my mean streak grieved him, not so much because it caused him pain but because it was doing me harm. His remark, as wise as that of any Abba from the desert, felt like an exorcism. Not that my temptation to anger was magically gone, but it called me to pay attention to something that, needed, that badly needed attention and that was hurting our marriage. Robert Fulgham, if you remember, wrote the book, All I Really Need to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. Beside the mirror in his bathroom, he tacked a picture of a woman who wasn't his wife. Every morning when he shaved, he looked at the picture of that small, humped-over woman wearing sandals and a blue Eastern robe and headdress. She was surrounded by important-looking people in tuxedos, and evening gowns and the regalia of royalty. It is the picture of Mother Teresa receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. The picture reminds Fulgham that more than any national citizenship, more than any pope, more than any chief executive officer of a major corporation, that woman has authority because she's a servant. People asked, Jesus asked people, who do you say I am? Do you love me? Do you believe? These are questions to ponder as we try to grasp who Jesus really is. The account of Jesus teaching in the synagogue and healing the demon-possessed man happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The Jesus I find in the gospel is so appealing, so authentic, yet so misunderstood by the Jewish religious leaders, they became increasingly threatened by Jesus' authority and questioned him about every infraction of the law. This is the Jesus I see. He forgave the woman caught in adultery and kept her from being stoned while her accusers backed away. Jesus forgave the prostitute, Mary Magdalene, and accepted her gift of feet washing 
while he sat at a table with a rich man and his guests. Jesus loved children. He was compassionate to those who were in, were in physical and spiritual pain and healed all who came to him. He cried when Lazarus died and brought him back to life. He taught his disciples and anyone else who came to listen gems like the Sermon on the Mount and the parables. He was astute when the Pharisees and scribes tried to trick him. In his death, Jesus showed us ultimate love and paved the way for a new fellowship of believers. He was a genius, yet a servant. He was powerful, yet gentle. He demonstrated an authority of love. There's a story of a battleship at sea on maneuvers in heavy weather for several days. The visibility was poor with patchy fog, so the captain remained on the bridge, keeping an eye on all the, the activities. Shortly after dark, the lookout reported light bearing on the starboard bow. Is it steady or moving, the captain called out. The lookout replied, steady, captain. The captain signaled out, we are on a collision course. Advise you change course 20 degrees. The signal came back, advisable for you to change course 20 degrees. The captain became annoyed. I'm a captain. Change course 20 degrees. I'm a seaman, second class, came the reply. You had better change course 20 degrees. Finally, the captain spat out, I'm a battleship. Back came the flashing light, I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> the captain changed course. Sometimes we forget that we're dealing with God and feel we can question his authority, but God is the lighthouse. We need to change course. As I grow older, I see more need for change in myself and my beliefs. I experience more forgiveness and I become more convinced of God's love. As a last illustration, there was a prisoner at the bar being charged with treason. Prisoner, said the Grand Inquisitor, you are charged with encouraging people to break the laws, traditions, and customs of our holy religion. How do you plead? Guilty, Your Honor. And with frequenting the company of heretics, prostitutes, public sinners, the extortionist tax collectors, in short, the excommunicated, how do you plead? Guilty, Your Honor. Also, with publicly criticizing and denouncing those who have been placed in authority within the Church of God, how do you plead? Guilty, Your Honor. Finally, you are charged with revising, correcting, calling into question the sacred tenets of our faith. How do you plead? Guilty, Your Honor. What is your name, prisoner? Jesus Christ, Your Honor. I wonder how dramatically different church would look if we fully understood what God intended it to be. Jesus demonstrated an authority of love, of inclusion, of, a challenge, of challenging tradition, and calls us to an authentic faith in God. And we stand amazed. <laughs>